Welcome to Come Follow Me, New Testament Week 3. Today we're going to be dealing with Matthew 2 and Luke 2. Before we begin, I just want to point out to people that it will be helpful this year to look at the Gospel Library maps as we traverse up and down the Holy Land. Another place you can look for maps is in the Institute Manual, the New Testament Student Manual. Actually, the maps here are a little bit more detailed. Okay, jumping in. From the Institute Manual, Caesar Augustus was a capable and energetic Roman ruler whose reign from 31 BC to AD 14 was marked by order and lawfulness. The taxing mentioned in Luke 2 was actually an enrollment of persons for future taxation purposes, an enrollment that required the taxpayer to personally submit required information. Because both Joseph and Mary were descendants of King David, they were required to make the journey to Bethlehem, which was King David's hometown. It is also possible that Joseph owned property in Bethlehem, further mandating him to register in Bethlehem. This will become more important a little later in our discussion. Ancient prophets had testified that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in the land of Jerusalem. So Luke 2, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all his empire should be taxed. Again, as we've indicated before, this tax, it would be better rendered as enrolled or registered. Here we have a map on the right-hand side that shows the distance that they traveled from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And you can see that Bethlehem is just south of Jerusalem. The distance they would have traveled would be about 150 kilometers. I want to remind you of a scripture that we read last week in Matthew 1. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. So you can remember that Joseph had a visitation from the angel Gabriel, and he immediately rose up and got married. Typically, the paintings we have of Joseph and Mary are of Mary, very pregnant, sitting on a donkey. A couple of things to note here. He married her immediately after she came back from visiting Elizabeth, which would have been at about the three, four month period. And so it's unlikely that they took this long journey of 150 kilometers after waiting for another five or six months. It's likely that they went right away because Joseph was, of course, concerned how everybody would treat his wife and she being pregnant would have caused great difficulties. Traveling that 150 kilometers when you're nine months pregnant would be extremely difficult. And there likely was no donkey. We have no reference in the scriptures to a donkey. There could be a donkey, but we just don't have any description of it. Verse three, and all went to be taxed everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now it says in the King James Version, great with child, but it doesn't say that in the Greek. If you look at the New Language Translation, it says he took with him Mary to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Doesn't indicate that she was ready to give birth immediately. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Again, if you look at the Greek, it doesn't sound like as soon as she got there that she was ready to deliver. Verse 7, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And the Joseph Smith translation changes that to inns. From the Institute Manual, travelers typically stayed at quarters, which were rectangular structures with open rooms overlooking a central courtyard where the traveler's animals were kept. The Joseph Smith translation indicates there was no room for Mary and Joseph in the inns. It's therefore likely that there were no openings in the rooms above on the night of the Savior's birth. The couple was required to stay in the crowded courtyard where the traveler's animals were kept. An alternate suggestion that's come forth recently is that Joseph likely owned land in Bethlehem, and they also postulate the idea that there may have been a cave on that land and because Joseph was a builder, that he may have been in the process of building a home when the baby came along. And so they would have been living in a cave or some other temporary structure until the home was built. The manger 
that the Savior was put into comes from the Latin. Now, I know the Italian mangiare, which means to eat, which was a stone trough for animals to eat from. There's an interesting image here. Jesus is presented to us to symbolically feast upon, to consume. He is given to us as a heavenly gift to nourish and to become a part of us. There's also a sacramental element as we think of partaking of the tokens of his holy sacrifice. Interestingly enough, Bethlehem, Bethlehem, means house of bread. And Bethlehem actually was one of the main contributors to watering Jerusalem. So the bread and water came from Bethlehem, from Elder Bruce D. Porter. His birth, like his life, teaches us that there's nothing wrong with humble origins, with poverty, simplicity, and obscurity. There's nothing to be ashamed of in being outcast from society, in being forced to dwell apart from the world, literally or figuratively. Poverty is no disgrace, and a shelter for animals may be a temple of God's spirit as surely as any more elegant dwelling. Christ's birth and simple upbringing are a reminder to us that we must never look down on anyone because of their origins or worldly status. If we scorn the humble, we may unwittingly scorn the chosen of God's children on earth. Luke 2, 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, this is a very typical part of the New Testament to read, especially during Christmas. But I can't read this without thinking about Charlie Brown's Christmas. Now, I know I'm dating myself here, but I just remember Charlie Brown throwing his hands out in frustration saying, can anybody tell me what the meaning of Christmas is? And then Linus very succinctly steps out into front stage and then says, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I can't help but wonder if we weren't part of that angelic host, praising God. Now, you might question why they went to the shepherds. Well, the shepherd's duty especially near the temple, was to identify which of the lambs was the firstborn. And they would routinely tie loosely around the neck of the firstborn male lamb, a red marker to indicate that they were bound to the temple for sacrifice. Continuing in Luke verse 15, came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us now go unto Bethlehem. And see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told unto them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now remember, the shepherd's duty was to identify the firstborn lambs. And so it's fitting and symbolic that they would be the first to identify and to testify of the Lamb of God. From President Packer, it is not wise to continually talk of unusual spiritual experiences. They are to be guarded with care and shared only when the Spirit itself prompts you to use them to the blessing of others. I heard President Marion G. Romney once counsel mission presidents and their wives. I found out that if I talked too lightly of sacred things, thereafter the Lord would not trust me. We are, I believe, to keep these things and ponder them in our hearts, as Luke said Mary did of the supernal events that surrounded the birth of Christ. After Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph presented him at the temple in accordance with Jewish law. As an aside, Mary and Joseph's offering indicates that they were not particularly wealthy. A new mother was to bring a lamb for a burnt offering. But as Leviticus tells us, 
And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. And that is what Mary brought. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten, and the Greek translation here identifies that this means revelation. A light to reveal to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Now, I actually went a little deeper and I'm showing you here the Greek. The Greek to lighten is apocalypsis. Now, that's important because you'll meet that near the end of the year when we talk about the book of apocalypsis, which is revelations. And there was one Anna. This is verse 36, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. From Gay Strathern, in the ancient world, as in the modern, the fundamental purpose of attending the temple was and is to enter the presence of God. Thus, Elder Bruce R. McConkie describes the temple as a holy sanctuary set apart from the world, wherein the saints of God prepare to meet their Lord, where the pure in heart shall see God according to the promises. Yet on this day, Anna was one of the only two people, as Luke recorded, who recognized the presence of God. From President Oaks, Anna and Simeon were eyewitnesses to the infant. But just like the Savior's apostles, their knowledge of his divine mission came through the witness of the Holy Ghost. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, we can properly say that when each received this witness, Simeon was a prophet and Anna was a prophetess. Each then fulfilled the prophetic duty to testify to those around them. As Peter said, to Christ give all the prophets witness. This was what Moses meant when he expressed the wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. From President Nelson, the most important truth the Holy Ghost will ever witness to you is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we're going to skip over here now to Matthew. This is chapter 2, verse 1. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, and this is where the Joseph Smith translation changes it a little bit. Where is the child that is born the Messiah of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. From a study Bible commentary, we read, the wise men would likely have been familiar with the Old Testament prophecy through interactions with Jews in Babylon. Remember, there are still way more Jews in Babylon than there are actually in Israel. And they may remember Balaam's prophecy that a star should come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That's recorded in Numbers 24. This was understood by the Jews to point to a messianic deliverer. The wise men likely traveled with a large number of attendants and guards for the long journey, which would have taken several weeks. For example, if they came by the regular trade route, it was about 800 miles. The average about 20 miles a day would have taken them more than a month, about 40 days. The movement of the star in verse 9 suggests that it was not a natural phenomenon, but rather supernatural, perhaps a guiding angel that appeared as a star, or perhaps some specially created heavenly phenomenon that had the brightness of a star. Continuing in verse 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. When the king's troubled, everybody's troubled. Continuing in verse 4, 5, and 6, we have a rather lengthy Joseph Smith translation. So this is JST, Matthew 3, verse 4. And when he had gathered, this is speaking of the king, 
all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them. And anything in italics is what Joseph Smith added, saying, where is the place that is written of by the prophets in which Christ should be born? For he greatly feared, yet he believed not the prophets. And they said unto him, it is written by the prophets that he shall be born in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus have they said. And the word of the Lord came unto us, saying, And thou, Bethlehem, which lieth in the land of Judea, in thee shall be born a prince, which are not the least among the princes of Judea. For out of thee shall come the Messiah, who shall save my people Israel. Then continuing back in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Notice that they say, young child, he's no longer a babe. And when they were coming to the house, now remember before, there was no house. They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, gold was typically given to kings, but who doesn't want gold for their birthday, right? Frankincense, we read in Leviticus, was used as incense in the temple. And myrrh was used in burial. And so this is very, very symbolic. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is also why... Historically, we say that there are three wise men because there were three gifts, but we don't really know how many there were. In some traditions, there are 12 wise men. Verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. 13, and when they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken out of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked, the translation here is a little sketchy. It should be really tricked or deceived by the wise men. He was exceedingly wroth or angry and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding regions from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Again, another indication that Jesus was not a baby when the wise men came. Verse 17, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, in Ramah, there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel, who is symbolic for Israel, weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. What a horrific man to have killed who knows how many children just because he was afraid that one small baby would upset his kingdom. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a vision, the Joseph Smith translation says, to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. You can see, started in Nazareth, went to Bethlehem, went to Egypt, now back to Bethlehem, and then on to Nazareth. And the reason he did that is in verse 22. When he heard that Archelaus, that would have been Herod's son, did reign in Judea in the place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding being warned of the God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called the Nazarene. There is an extended JST translation that we'll discuss in a, in a moment. From the Bible commentary, we read, Thus Matthew is saying that the Old Testament prophets foretold that the Messiah would be despised, comparable to the way in which the town of Nazareth was despised in the time of Jesus. Remember the saying, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, I want to note a scripture in Isaiah 11. 
because although it says it was foretold, we don't really have an exact scripture that says it, but we do have Isaiah 11 and 2 Nephi 21 that says, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch which shall grow out of his roots. And this word branch in Hebrew is netzer, which sounds like Nazareth. From the commentary, Matthew may also have intended a wordplay connecting the word Nazareth to the Old Testament messianic prophecy in Isaiah. Since Nazareth sounds like the word for branch in Hebrew, which was a designation for the Messiah. Now let's take a look at the JST extended version. This is found at the back of your paper scriptures, if, if you're using paper scriptures, because there's not room to squeeze it all in. Verse 24, came to pass that Jesus grew up with his brethren and waxed strong and waited upon the Lord for the time of his ministry to come. And he served under his father and he spake not as other men, neither could he be taught for he needed not that any man should teach him. And after many years, the hour of his ministry drew nigh from Elder McConkie. In our present state of spiritual understanding, it apparently is not intended that we have any appreciable knowledge of the life of Jesus prior to the beginning of his ministry. No doubt complete and full accounts will be available during the millennium. For in that day, the Lord has promised to reveal all things. Such knowledge as is now available, however, leads us to believe that the son of Mary participated in normal activities and experiences of the time, and was endowed with talents and spiritual capacities exceeding those of any other person who ever lived. That he was obedient and sinless is evident. Yet, with it all, he was subject to the restrictions and testings of mortality, was in all points tempted as other men are, and having continued from grace to grace, he finally received a fullness of the glory of the Father and perfected his own salvation now we're going to switch back to luke 2 verse 41 now his parents went to jerusalem every year at the feast of the passover and when he was 12 years old they went up to jerusalem after the custom of the feast any good jew would have traveled to jerusalem during the passover and they did and when they had fulfilled the days as they returned jesus tarried behind in jerusalem and joseph and his mother knew not of it verse 44 and they, supposing him to have been in the company, were a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. Imagine being Mary, thinking, oh, no, I've lost the Son of God. Ugh. I don't know if you've ever lost a child. I remember losing a five-year-old once in Walmart. That's Jennifer, and she was hiding in the, in the coat rack. But it was a traumatic experience. Verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Think PhD, doctor, teacher. And they were hearing him and asking him questions. That's from the GST. A little bit of a revision there. Verse 47. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Even at 12 years old, he was so far ahead of the doctors and the learned people at the time because he had been taught by his father. Heavenly Father, the prophet Joseph taught that as a boy, Jesus possessed superior intelligence to all mortals. When still a boy, he had all the intelligence necessary to enable him to rule and govern the kingdom of the Jews and could reason with the wisest and most profound doctors of law and divinity and make their theories and practice to appear like folly compared with the wisdom he possessed. Verse 48, and when they saw him, they were amazed and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, listen to this very gentle reproof after Mary talks about her and his father. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me, witst, or knew? Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? So even at age 12, he knew who his real father was and that he was doing what his father would have wanted him to do. And I think that there was a little bit of an undercurrent there that said, why didn't you come here first to my father's house? Then you would have found me sooner. Verse 50. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. From Elder Samuelson. Sometimes you might feel that your parents and leaders respond like Mary and Joseph did. 
After Jesus answered by asking his important question about his father's business, Luke records, they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Nevertheless, please pay close attention to what Jesus did. It is an example for what we must do if we're really to fulfill our duty to God. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. You must remember that your duty to God is very clearly linked to your duties to your own family members, particularly your parents. It is not only in being properly subject or submissive to God, but also to our parents and priesthood leaders that we truly fulfill our duty to God. That might make a great family home evening lesson. Verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So you can see from this description that he developed his wisdom, his physical body, his spirit, and socially with the people around him. And I find it very interesting that this is the very scripture that the children and youth program uses as their basis for the development of this new program. And I've included the link here. If you're not familiar with the children and youth program that your church recently, uh, two, two and a half years ago, introduced for our kids from President Benson. What manner of man was Jesus during these 30 years when he was personally preparing himself for his three-year ministry? Turning to the book of Luke, we read, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. From modern day revelation, we learned that Jesus received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness. We too should be moving from grace to grace in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. May we all follow our leader, Jesus Christ, and increase in stature mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially. So you can see here, we've concentrated on Luke and Matthew these last two weeks. And you can see that they're the same yet different. And this is to be expected because they are written to different groups of people for different reasons. It's a good thing to compare and contrast the story given by Matthew and the story given by Luke. Because although they describe the same events, they do it from a different point of view. It's so helpful for us to have actually four Gospels that speak of Jesus Christ. I hope you've enjoyed our overview of Matthew and Luke chapter 2. Next week, we're going to bring in John as a third witness. Make sure to keep studying. Not very much of a reading assignment this week, so we should all be able to complete it. I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Have a great week.